Today's BAP 205 lecture is going to be covering enclosed sounds and reflections. We're going to be running through some stuff in the video today. We're having a little bit of a chat about standing waves and axial modes, tangential modes and oblique modes. It's a bit of an introduction to some of these more complex things we're dealing with in acoustics. And over the next few weeks, we're going to discuss a little bit more in class. So today, if you have a look through this video, you can pause it and go back over some of the stuff that we cover. And then we're going to talk about it next week in the class as well. I've also got a very small exercise for you guys to try in your room today. Try and find out where the standing wave is. And we're also going to do this next week in class. Next week's lecture is going to cover how to use the Fuzz Measure Pro software, which we're going to start having a little bit of a look at today. So you may remember from the first week, we were talking a lot about how sound works. We were talking about the free field. We had a bit of discuss about the speed of sound, learning about wavelengths and frequencies, just recapping some of our audio information. We talked about sound in the free field. We talked about the inverse distance law and the inverse square law. So sound propagation in a free field, a big open wide field, we have no boundaries or reflections. And this is the ideal situation for sound when we're talking about it in theory. In the acoustics, and most of the stuff that we'll be studying is going to be in closed spaces, so studios or rooms, somewhere where we've got walls and we've got actual reflections. So in a free field, we've got uniformly progressing plane waves, which is basically just our sound traveling out. And we've got our inverse square law and inverse distance law from week one. So the inverse square and inverse distance law is referring to when we double the distance, the level drops by about six decibels. So we can use this out in an open field, we can use this at a festival somewhere, but it doesn't always explain what sound does in enclosed space, which is what we're talking about today. So to begin, when we're talking about enclosed sound, we're talking about sound inside a room, and we're dealing with reverb and reflections. When sound's bouncing around inside the room, it's bouncing off our walls, off the floor, and off the ceiling. This graph shows us our reverb and our reflections and some of the terms that we're going to start to use. On the left axis, we've got our amplitude or our volume, and down the bottom, we've got our time. The red lines show us our early reflections, and we've got our first reflection being the first big red line, followed by the second, the third, and the fourth reflections. So these early reflections are the ones that are really important. That's what's causing our echo in the room. The very big first red one is our first reflection, so that's probably the sound bouncing off the first wall or the closest wall to where our sound is. So if you're standing at the front of the room and talking, this is most likely either the floor or the ceiling or the closest wall. The blue lines are our later reflections, so these are extra echoes in the room, bouncing off other surfaces, maybe tables or chairs, or even sound bouncing off two or three walls and coming back. So the reflections are going to get quieter the more surfaces they're bouncing off, and also the further the sound is travelling. The light blue area shows our reverberant field, and this is basically what we call our reverb. That reverberant field of the light blue area is made up of all these large later reflections. You can see there's a few small blue later reflection lines on the graph. The blue area, though, is thousands of these later reflections. They get quieter and quieter as time goes on, and all these little reflections add up to what we call the reverb of the room. Reverb is basically just a whole bunch of reflections that are coming off all the surfaces in the room. So reflections and reverb are really the same thing. Our early reflections are the important things that we're going to have a look at today, but we're also going to be talking about reverb in a few weeks' time. And reverb is all our later reflections. But these early reflections or these first reflections is what we're talking about today. We're going to be discussing our standing waves. So this starts to give us a bit of an understanding of what causes reverb in a room, what causes that echo, that sound. If we've got a much bigger room, those reflections are probably going to be more often and a little bit longer. If we've got a smaller room, those reflections are going to be a lot stronger because the surfaces are a lot closer to our sound source. For example, if you track drums in a small room, those first early reflections are going to be the sound of maybe the snare drum bouncing off the floor, off the walls or off the ceiling. And the reverb is going to be those cymbals and snares also bouncing off all the surfaces in the room. I think it get quieter as time goes on. The first reflections and those early reflections is what's really important when we're talking about acoustics. That's what's going to help us really try to understand and explain what's going on with the sound in the room. This is what we need to treat more than anything else and what we're going to be talking about today. This next slide shows us some information about the near and far field. So in most rooms, the addition of the direct sound, the reflections from the enclosed surfaces affect the way the sound level decreases with distance. When we were talking about the free field, we had the inverse square or the inverse distance law to describe the entire sound field. And that's when we're doubling the distance, the level drops by about 6 dB. That rule doesn't really apply though when we're dealing with enclosed spaces. So when you're looking at a room, a room with walls, a floor and a ceiling, we've got sound bouncing off those surfaces. And those sounds are adding to the sound that's coming directly from the source. 
And this is our near and far field difference when we're dealing with enclosed spaces. The sound level in the room is going to be a combination of both the direct and the reverb levels. And this is what this diagram is showing us. The black line that's curving down is basically showing us how sound is decreasing over time. So if you follow that black line down all the way through that dotted line, that's our direct sound in the free field. The problem is within our enclosed space, the reverb and the reflections is adding to that direct sound. And that's why we see that solid black line curving down around the middle. At that critical distance where the dotted line and the solid black line change, that's the difference between our free field and our enclosed space. So again, the dotted line is our free field if we had no reflections. The solid black line that goes above it to the right, that's with our reflections and our reverb adding to that direct sound. The near field we can assume to be somewhere within a, maybe a couple of meters from the sound source. The far field would be the rear of the room, the second half of it. And this is basically where all the reflections of the walls and the reverb are adding to that direct sound and causing the sound not to follow that inverse square law. So when we're dealing with an enclosed space, we can't really apply that inverse square or inverse distance law. The doubling of the distance doesn't drop by six decibels anymore. So these are just terms that we're using in acoustics, near and far field. Near field is our space around the sound source, and far field is where all our enclosed surfaces are going to add to that direct sound, so the reflections and the reverb. You're going to be able to hear that reverberant field, you're going to be able to hear those echoes in the room, obviously the further we are from the sound source. If you're right next to the sound source, you're mostly going to be listening to the direct sound. And we can almost assume that's like the free field. Enclosed spaces like our control rooms and our live rooms are a little bit more complex to calculate and we can't really apply the inverse square or that inverse distance law. So in our enclosed spaces, when we're talking about the near field, it's sometimes referred to as the pressure field. So it's a really small distance from the sound source, usually about a quarter of the wavelength of the frequency that we're listening to. The reflections at this point are negligible. We're not really listening to the echo, the reflections or the reverb in the room. So when you mic up acoustic guitar like we've got in the picture, that's considered the near field, and we really don't hear the echo or the space in the room. So if you're close micing vocals or acoustic guitar, we don't really need the sound of the room to come into play. We can't really hear the room. The space that you're listening to really doesn't affect the sound that much. If I had room mics on a guitar, room mics on a drum kit, that's where I'd start to actually hear the sound of the room or our far field. So our far field is very much a greater distance from the source than the linear dimensions of the source itself. So if you've got a snare drum that's about 14 inches across, our far field would be a lot bigger than 14 inches. Near field might be within about 14 inches of that snare drum. The reflections is what's going to dominate the sound in our far field. This is what we hear in our room mics on our drum kit like we've got in the picture below. The pattern of the waveforms in our far field are going to be a lot more even. So it can be a little bit confusing when you're talking about near and far field. The important thing we need to take from both of these is those terms that we're talking about near and far field. And again, remember everything that we're talking about now is enclosed spaces, inside a room, inside a drum, inside an acoustic guitar, anything where we've got reflections. And that's where most of our acoustic study and work is done. When you're dealing with the free field, that's great for theory, but it doesn't really apply to most of our everyday life situations. All these terms can be confusing for some people. What we're trying to pick up though is the general concept of what we're talking about and the names of these terms. We're going to be talking a lot more about reflections and standing waves today. Okay, so there were some interesting concepts for us to talk about. We've got those terms near and far field and again we're talking about enclosed spaces. We were talking about the reflections, so we got those first early reflections and that's really what we're going to try and discuss now. When we're looking at these reflections, we've got a couple of different things we want to have a look at. First off, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Basically all that means is when sound hits a surface, it bounces off at exactly the same angle, but in the opposite direction. So if your sound hits the wall, it might be a snare drum, it's going to bounce off at the same angle. So this is with a nice flat surface, and this works well in theory. A lot of the concepts that we're discussing in acoustics are going to make a little bit more sense in a few weeks' time once we start pulling all the information together. It can be very confusing these first few weeks, and this is part of the reason that we're starting with these videos. Trying to get you guys a little bit of information, trying to let us have time to absorb and understand what's going on with this. Not everyone understands all the information we cover in the first few weeks, and it probably will take you a couple of different goes of having a listen to this information before it really starts to sink in.
I guarantee if you stick with it, by the end of this trimester, we'll all know what's going on with these reflections and standing waves. And it's going to help you a lot with your study of sound. It's also going to help you set up your own home studio, soundproof your rooms. It's going to help you understand sounds of drums and stringed instruments. It's really more of a conceptual understanding of sound is what we're trying to achieve here in acoustics. It's not always easy to try and grasp all this technical information, but I promise it's going to get a lot more practical as we go on each week. So this next slide is showing us the same thing. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So if we've got our sound source and it's hitting a wall, it's going to be bouncing off of that same angle. And it'll also sound like the sound image is coming from the other side of the wall. And that's what this diagram is showing us here. So this is helpful because we're trying to visualise what sound is doing in the room. You can't see sound, and that's one of the problems when we're discussing acoustics. It's very hard to understand something that we can't see. We can use our ears, but what we want to try and do is visualise what's actually happening with the sound inside a room. So when you're recording drums or you're mixing your song, you can think about whether this wall or this surface next to my mixing room is actually going to cause problems. Am I hearing the sound bouncing off that wall or am I just listening to the sound direct from the speakers? It's going to change what you're listening to. It's going to change how we're mixing. It's going to change what we're doing when we're recording our sounds in the studio. So those other slides were about sound bouncing off a flat surface. We've also got another term called diffraction. And this is where sound is curving around an object. So you might have a pillar in the room. It could even be the mic stand in front of the drums. Is that going to actually cause a difference with the sound? With diffraction, sound will actually wrap around that object. And so you get the sound waves rejoining behind the object. A lot of this stuff isn't hugely important for us to know, but again, it's just trying to get a better understanding of how sound is working inside a room. As music producers and audio engineers, we don't really need to get down into the physics of the situation, but with the study of acoustics, it's important that we try and understand conceptually how sound is actually moving around inside a room. So apart from diffraction, we've also got convex and concave surfaces. Convex surface, like we're looking at here, is a curved surface that's sticking out from the wall. So this could be something on a rounded corner, this could be something sticking out from the wall, and when sound's hitting this, it's bouncing off again at different angles. This is fairly straightforward. Concave surfaces are rounded inside corners. So when sound's hitting these concave surfaces, they're usually reflecting back onto themselves. This is one of the reasons why a round room isn't going to sound very even. So you've got all the reflections heading back into the centre. Right in the middle of the room, you're going to get all the reflections from each side of the room. We also don't want square corners, but again, it's just trying to understand how sound is reacting when it's bouncing off different surfaces. Sometimes this combination of all these sounds on a concave surface can be helpful, like the inside of an actual drum. When we think about the inside of a drum, it's exactly the same as a room. The drum is just a small room with all these reflections inside of it. We're going to talk about standing waves in a minute, and a lot of people talk about standing waves like they're a bad thing. But standing waves is what we use to create sound on an acoustic guitar, or inside a drum. So without standing waves, we wouldn't have the resonance that we get for our musical instruments. Refraction is talking about how sound travels as it passes through different substances. So maybe through air or water, or also when sound hits wood or brick. The angle is going to change depending on the substance. Again, it's just the term refraction that we're looking at for this. So it's not reflection, but refraction when the sound is passing through a different substance and it's going to change its angle. This is a diagram of refraction from a sound traveling from air into stone and then stone into wood and then wood back into air. So this might be a wall of your studio and as sound travels through this wall, it's going to change its angle ever so slightly. This is called refraction. Again, there's a lot of physics involved with sound. We don't need to get right down and have to work out the angles of these refraction. What we're looking at is just the term refraction. So this is when sound changes its direction when it's heading through different materials. Okay, so there was a lot of terms there talking about how sound reacts when it's traveling through different substances, how it reacts when it bounces off different surfaces. But there's three main things we need to understand when sound hits a wall. First thing, we're going to get some reflection. Part of the sound reflects back off the wall, and we will talk about the angle of incidence being equal to the angle of reflection. So this sound hits a wall and then bouncing back off that wall. The second thing that's going to happen when sound hits a wall is absorption. Some of that sound is also absorbed by the wall. It's actually transferred into heat. The sound hits the wall, the wall is going to vibrate ever so slightly, and that's going to be transferred into heat. It's a very low amount of heat. You're not going to be able to feel the wall heating up from sound pumping into it. 
but that's part of our sound getting lost into the vibrations of the wall. The third thing that's going to happen is some of the sound is going to also transmit through the wall, and that's our transmission. So that's our soundproofing. If the wall is not well soundproofed, we're going to have lots of transmission. So this is what happens with sound when it hits a wall. Some of it's reflected, some of it's absorbed by vibrations in the wall, and some of it's actually transmitted straight through the wall. So this helps us understand what's going on with sound inside a room. We're going to be using these three terms quite a fair bit in acoustics. This explains what happens with sound when it hits a surface. And that's what we're talking about with acoustics more than anything else. Reflection, absorption, and transmission. Again, the reflections are going to be the sound inside the room. There are standing waves, the reverb, the reflections in the room. Absorption is going to be how much material absorbs certain sounds. Different materials absorb different frequencies well. Carpet and curtains, for example, absorb high frequencies well. So if we have carpet or curtains in our room, a lot of the high frequencies are going to get absorbed. They're not going to transmit through the wall. They're not going to reflect inside the room. And transmission is referring to our soundproofing, how solid our walls are, how much sound it's actually going to stop. Most of our study of acoustics is dealing with the reflections inside the room, and that's going to be the first half of this trimester. The second half, we're going to start talking a lot more about transmission or soundproofing, and it's going to get a lot more practical to help you understand how you can soundproof your jam room or your home studio so we don't annoy our neighbours and so we also don't get sounds travelling between different rooms. So we've got a few more terms we're going to talk about today. We're going to explain these a little bit more in person next week in our lecture, but today we're just trying to get some of these basic information out. We've got this other term called mean free path. The mean free path, or MFP, is the average distance sound travels between successive reflections. So we've got sound bouncing over all the surfaces in the room. You've got your voice or a snare drum that bounces off the left wall and then the right wall and the rear wall. Some of the sounds bounce off the roof and the ceiling. The mean free path is the average distance that each reflection is traveling. So it's taking all the reflections in the room and averaging them out. The equation for mean free path is 4 times the volume divided by the surface area of the room, or 4V divided by S. Again, another equation in acoustics. We don't need to worry too much about this. You don't need to write this down. It's an equation that we're going to use when we're doing our second assignment, but it's not overly important. So for example, in a room measuring 25 by 20 by 10 meters, the average sound travels a distance of about 10.5 meters between reflections. So four times the volume of the room, which is going to be 5,000, divided by 1,900, which is the surface area of the room. How is this useful? Well, the speed of sound is about 344 meters per second. And so at this speed, it's going to take about 30.5 milliseconds to travel that mean free distance of about 10.5 meters. So in other words, about 32 to 33 reflections take place every one second. So it helps us try and understand how many reflections are going on inside the room. And there's a lot of reflections that are happening inside a room. They add up very quickly, and that's where we get our reverberant field, our reverb from. Again, this mean free path can be a difficult thing to try and understand. It's helpful when we're trying to visualize how many reflections are going on inside a room. And again, it's the average distance that each of these reflections have inside the room. So this gets us on to talking about standing waves. Standing waves are reflected sound that are happening between two walls. So we can see in this diagram here, we've got this yellow and this green wave that's traveling throughout the room. A standing wave is this waveform that's hitting one wall and then bouncing back to the other wall and then bouncing back to that first wall again. So we can only get a standing wave in a room with two walls. And so this standing wave is either doubling up or canceling itself out, depending on the frequency. Our standing waves occur when the width of the room or one of the dimensions of the room matches up with the wavelength of the frequency. So in these diagrams here, we can see the red line on that top being the incident waves, that's the start of the wave. The dotted line would be where that waveform would continue on going, but it's hitting that black wall and it's bouncing back with the blue line, a reflected wave. What this is going to do is cancel each other out. So it equals that green line on the right, and basically it cancels the sound out and we almost hear complete silence. This is the cancelling of the sound. If that incident wave is halfway through the wavelength when it hits the wall, it will bounce back and actually double up, and that's our bottom diagram. You can see the green on the bottom right, where it's actually doubled the volume of the sound. So standing waves occur in rooms, and it's either cancelling or doubling up, depending on where you're standing in the room. If you measure the distance of the room, you measure the wavelength that's occurring in that room, you can find the sound is either increasing or cancelling itself out in the room. And you'll find pockets where it's very loud and other pockets where it's very quiet when you figure out where the standing waves are occurring inside the room.
Again, this can be a little bit confusing when we're first starting to bring up the concept today. It'll start to make a little bit more sense. And next week in class, we're all going to create a bit of a standing wave inside the classroom, get up, walk around and see if we can try and visualize and hear actually what's going on with the standing waves inside a room. So our lower standing wave occurs when the wavelength is two times the distance of the room. So the wavelength again is the length of one of those cycles. So we might have a frequency of about 35 hertz. That has a wavelength of about 9.8 meters. So that means that one cycle of that 35 hertz waveform is about 9.8 meters long. Now if our room is 9.8 meters wide, that frequency is going to bounce back and forth between the left and the right wall of that room. It's going to double up and cancel out in different places in the room. So that 35 hertz frequency is going to be very loud in some places and very, very quiet in other places. This is our standing wave. It's this waveform that's bouncing between two surfaces of the room. Now we've got lots of different pairs of surfaces in the room. We've got the length, which is the front and the back of the room, the width, the left and the right of the room, and also the floor and the ceiling. So these standing waves can occur between any of these two surfaces. Standing waves will also occur at multiples of that primary or resonant frequency. So you're going to get another standing wave at 70 hertz, and then another standing wave at 140 hertz. And these are our different standing waves in the room. So our standing waves are caused by frequencies bouncing between two surfaces, and they're based off the actual dimensions of the room itself. So in our example, in that room, if we were tracking drums, we would get a lot of 35 hertz being very loud in some places of the room, and 35 hertz being very quiet in other places and again with 70 hertz. If the room was square and had the same length and the width, so both the length and the width were 9.8 meters, there would be doubling up of those standing waves on both surfaces, so it would be a lot more extreme. So in acoustics, a standing wave is defined as room resonance. If a wavelength and closer dimension are related, the points of maximum and minima will not move, hence the name standing wave. So this is our frequencies bouncing around in the room and they're doubling up or cancelling each other out. We can simulate a standing wave in any room by measuring its dimensions. So from the first week's class, we knew that wavelength, or lambda, this is that upside down y, is equal to our speed of sound divided by frequency, and frequency is equal to the speed of sound divided by wavelength. So we can figure out the frequency of the standing wave in the room if we replace the wavelength with the room length. So if you go get a measuring tape and you measure one of the widths of your room, it may be 4 meters wide. We take the speed of sound, which is about 344 meters per second, divide that by four, and that's going to be your first standing wave. If you pump that frequency into the room properly with the signal generator from Pro Tools, you'll hear certain parts of the room being very loud and other parts of the room being very quiet. This is our first fundamental standing wave inside the room. With the standing wave, we have things called nodes. There's a pressure node and an anti-pressure node. The pressure node is where those standing waves are cancelling each other out, and so we actually get the sound being very, very quiet or almost silent. The anti-node is where those sounds are doubling up on each other. So if you walk around the room and you hear a very loud 35 hertz, that's our anti-node. Where it's cancelled out is called our pressure node. Again, these are just the names and the terms we use to describe it. Don't panic if you're not sure on what we're talking about at the moment, if it's all getting a little bit confusing. I guarantee by the end of trimester, these standing waves will become very obvious. It's a little bit hard to visualize, and particularly the first time someone tries to explain it to you, which is again why we're going through it in the video now, and then we're going to talk about it a lot more in class next week. These standing waves are the main basis for most of our acoustic study. It's about balancing out the frequencies in the room so they're nearly even. You're never going to completely get rid of standing waves, and as I said before, standing waves aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're exactly how we get a note out of an acoustic guitar. Standing waves is how strings work on a violin, a cello, or a guitar, and also how drums work as well. Without a standing wave, we wouldn't have any resonance in a drum, we wouldn't have any resonance in an acoustic guitar. We wouldn't be able to get a note out of a string, for example. So this diagram again is talking about finding that lowest frequency or that fundamental standing wave inside the room. So the lowest frequency standing wave is our fundamental. It's often called F1. So again, to calculate that first fundamental standing wave, which will be our loudest and strongest standing wave in the room, we can get the speed of sound and divide it by two times the length. Another way of saying this, if the room dimension is half the distance of the wavelength, then that's going to be our frequency of our standing wave. Standing waves can be a big issue, particularly in a mixing room. If we've got that 35 hertz being our fundamental standing wave, then again what that means is that at 70 hertz we've also got another standing wave, 
in some places in that room, that 70 hertz is going to be really loud. And in other places, that 70 hertz is going to be almost silent. So you might be mixing and you might think, oh, I've got a lot of 70 hertz in my mix. My kick drum is very subby. And you may actually just be in the wrong place in the room. You move somewhere else in the room and you can't hear that 70 hertz at all. So it causes a bit of an issue. It's not going to change the sound of our recording, but it changes what we're listening to when we're mixing inside our control room. And that's very important when we're doing our EQ and we're balancing out our frequencies in our mix. So having a very even room, trying to get rid of some of these standing waves, or at least subdue them somewhat, or at least understand where they are, is going to help us to mix our songs a lot better. Our second multiple, our second standing wave, is that 70 hertz that we were just talking about. It's sometimes called F2. So this is just two times that original standing wave or that original fundamental. So again, you can calculate that original standing wave, that original fundamental, by taking the speed of sound and dividing it by two times the length of the room. The third multiple is our third standing wave. And again, this is just three times the fundamental. So in our 35 hertz discussion we were talking about just a minute ago, our third standing wave is going to be at 105 hertz for that particular room. So again, if your dimension of your room is 9.8 meters, we're going to have a standing wave at 35 hertz, another one at 70 hertz, and then another one at 105 hertz, and another one at 140 hertz. And these are the multiples of those standing waves. And there's going to be one of them for each of the different dimensions of the room. So again, a square room is the worst situation because we're going to have that standing wave for two different dimensions of the room, which means it's going to be twice as obvious in that particular room. There are certain rooms that have no reflections, and here's a picture of what we call an anechoic chamber. Anechoic chambers are considered to actually be free field. They have so much absorption in the room, they have all these diffusers that we don't actually get any reflections in the room. We use these a lot to test electronic equipment. They put TVs or VCRs or mobile phones in these rooms to test what frequencies are actually coming off the device without the room affecting the sound at all. Anechoic chambers are quite difficult to build. They're highly technical, and they can be quite uncomfortable to stay in for more than about 20 minutes. You'll start to get nauseated. You can feel the blood pumping in your ears. You can hear your own heartbeat. It's an absolutely dead silent room with no reflections and no static noise. So when we're talking about these standing waves in our room, we've actually got names for the different standing waves that occur in our room depending on what surfaces they're reflecting off. Our most obvious ones and also the strongest standing waves in the room are the ones that are bouncing just between two surfaces, and they're called axial modes. So an axial mode is a standing wave. Modes and standing waves are exactly the same thing. Axial modes are our strongest standing waves, and they again occur between two surfaces. So it could be the front and the back of the room, it could be the left and the right of the room, and it also could be the floor and the ceiling. So that's the sound that's bouncing back and forth between those two surfaces. Axial modes, again, are by far the strongest and the most important when we're looking at the acoustics of a room. The second type of mode we got is a tangential mode. Tangential modes are bouncing off four surfaces of the room. So this is a standing wave that's occurring, that's possibly bouncing off the side wall, the back wall, the other side wall, the front wall, and then back to that side wall. Could also be bouncing off the floor, the back wall, the ceiling, the front wall, and the floor again. So any standing wave doesn't have to be just between two surfaces, it can be actually between four surfaces. A tangential mode is a standing wave that reflects off four different surfaces. Because it's bouncing off four surfaces, it's half as strong as the axial mode. So tangential modes are still important, they're just not as strong as our axial modes. The third type of mode we got is called an oblique mode. An oblique mode is again a standing wave that is bouncing off all six surfaces of the room. So the side wall, the back wall, the ceiling, the right wall, the front wall, the floor, the left wall, and then again, repeating in that cycle. So again, a standing wave cannot just be one reflection. It's a waveform that's continuously bouncing off all these different surfaces, all happening within a few split seconds. All three of these modes are helpful when we're trying to analyze a room. We're looking at the dimensions of the room, and that's what's going to determine which frequencies are going to be causing standing waves inside those rooms. So again, we have axial modes that are bouncing off two surfaces in the room, any two surfaces. We've got tangential modes that are bouncing off four surfaces, and they're half as strong as axial modes. And then we've got oblique modes that are bouncing off six surfaces, and they're half as strong as tangential modes, or a quarter as strong as axial modes. So the axial modes are the most important ones. So simply measuring the length or the width or the height of a room, we can calculate the three fundamental axial modes of a room, and we can figure out where all these modes are. Our second assignment that we're doing later in the semester, our full acoustic analysis, is going to be giving us a room, and we're going to work out all the different modes, all the different standing waves that are occurring inside that room.
We're going to use Microsoft Excel to do this because it is quite a large complex equation and we have a big equation for working out these modes and standing waves. So you can actually work out the modes and the standing waves of a room before you've even built the room. So when you're building a studio, when you're designing a room, you can pick some dimensions that minimize the amount of standing waves that are going to be occurring in the room. Again, I'd like to reiterate that standing waves aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're very unhelpful inside a mixing room because I want that room to sound even. I want to listen to the sound directly from the speakers. I don't want it to affect what I'm listening to. But inside a drum, inside an acoustic guitar, if you think of that like a small room, we need those modes, particularly in a drum. The length and the width and the dimensions of a snare drum is an axial mode that's going to resonate at a certain frequency, and that's what gives that drum a note. It's what gives a guitar string and an acoustic guitar a note. So standing waves is what cause musical resonance, and that's actually a good thing a lot of the time, just not in our acoustic study and not in our control rooms. We're going to talk a lot more about these modes and standing waves, and again, if you're not quite following along with what's going on today, don't panic. We're going to talk about this more next week. We're going to be talking about this all trimester. Today we were just trying to get a little bit of this information, some of these terms out so we start to understand them. Axial modes, tangential modes, and oblique modes, again, are all standing waves. And standing waves is when frequency is reflecting off two different surfaces back and forth, either cancelling or adding up depending on where you are in the wave. So a standing wave in a room might be very loud in one place, you move to another place in the room, and that standing wave is completely cancelled out. That's why some places in a room might sound very bassy, and other places might sound quite thin. The standing waves are a lot stronger in those lower fundamental frequencies, those fundamental frequencies are the first reflections of the rooms. Those fundamental frequencies are generally our base frequencies. So low frequency base standing waves are the biggest issues we have with acoustics in a room. Measuring the frequency response of a room could be another way of us looking at these standing waves. We might have a room that sounds very bassy. It's not picking up a lot of the high end. It could be because of the surfaces, or it also could be because there's a lot of standing waves in the low end that are doubling up certain frequencies. The audible spectrum of hearing for humans is quite large, and also in terms of the wavelength. If we're looking at that 20 hertz, that very low bassy frequency we can hear, all the way up to 20 kilohertz, the wavelength of a 20 hertz wave is about 17 meters long, and a 20 kilohertz waveform is about 1.7 centimeters long. That's such a large difference in wavelength. The 1.7 centimeter wavelength bounces off a lot of different surfaces in the room. Small objects in the room, could be even a doorknob, could be a PowerPoint, could be a chair, is going to make a big difference with that 1.7 centimeter wavelength. But that 17 meter wavelength is not really going to be affected by a chair in the room or a small object. For wavelengths 17 meters long, a 1 meter chair is very rarely not going to cause too many problems with it. No single analytical approach can cover sound over such a wide range, so we break this frequency region down into four areas, A, B, C, and D. So we're going to have a look at that on the next slide. This graph here shows us what we refer to as our frequency regions. Where these regions start and end, A, B, C, and D, change every single time. They're not set at any certain frequency. When we look at this frequency response diagram, and it might be the frequency response of a certain room, we can see the region between A and B is what we call the fundamental frequency. So that gap where A turns into B, that's our first standing wave. And in this diagram here, it's about 39 hertz you can see there. That's where our first standing wave is actually occurring. Below that, it doesn't mean we don't have sound in that room, it just means that we don't have any extra sound in the room. We don't have any boosting of it, we don't have any standing wave or room resonance below it. So in this diagram, the bit gap between A and B is our first fundamental or our standing wave, what we worked out before. We call that first fundamental F1, our first standing wave or our first axial mode, if you like. And again, that's the speed of sound divided by two times the length of the room. Once we move into that region B, this is where we've got a lot more of our standing waves. And this is where our fundamental modes dominate. Again, fundamental modes, they're our fundamental standing waves, they're our strong, important initial standing waves. So the area of B is where we have our standing wave from our length, our standing wave from our width, and our standing wave from our height. So there's not very many standing waves in this area, but that's why they're a lot more obvious. They're also a lot stronger. Once we move into that area C, that's where modal density increases. And we use the term modal density. Again, there are modes, the density of our modes, the density of our standing waves. So in that region C, we've got lots and lots of standing waves. These are our multiples of our axials, our tangentials, and our oblique modes. So these standing waves are occurring more and more often in that region C, 
And that's our modal density increasing. That's not actually a bad thing. They start evening out because there's so many standing waves in that higher area. The multiples, the frequencies are all blending together. When we move into section D, that's our reflections prevail. So we've got so many reflections, so many echoes in that region D, our high frequency area, that we don't worry too much about them. Our ear can't hear any one certain frequency being louder than others. There are so many standing waves in this upper area that they generally just even out. So this is how we break apart our frequency regions when we're analysing a room. Again, region A, there are no modes present. It doesn't mean there isn't sound down here. We do have frequencies at 20 hertz and 10 hertz in the room. It just means we haven't hit our first axial standing wave. So we haven't got our first mode yet. There aren't extra frequencies being boosted in this region. Region B is where our fundamental modes dominate. These are our first initial standing waves, usually our axial modes. Axial modes are by far the strongest. They're the most obvious we're going to find down our low area. And that's what's going to cause problems with our mixers. We're going to have a big dip maybe at 60 hertz. You can see on our diagram here, there's another big dip at about 110 hertz. So we're not going to hear 110 hertz well in that room. And that's going to cause a few problems with us. Other places in that room, the 110 hertz will be very loud. We just have to be aware of where our mixing chair is sitting, what's going on, where we're listening in the room. And that's why it sometimes sounds different when you're at the back of the room or the front of the room. It's why we need to be more concerned about how the sound is interacting, where we're actually sitting at the height that our ears are in our mixing room. So we're almost done. We've got a couple more slides left to go for today. Again, there was a lot of information, a lot of new terms, and that's why I wanted to bring it out in this video so you could watch it again. You can start to get a little bit of an understanding through it, and we're going to explain this a lot more. By the end of the trimester, we're going to really understand these standing waves. We're going to know what an axial mode is, a tangential mode, an oblique mode. We're going to know how to calculate this from an existing room, and also how to calculate it from a room that hasn't been built yet. This next diagram is our frequency response analysis. We get this by using a test microphone. We're going to pump all the frequencies of the spectrum inside a room, and the microphone is going to pick up certain frequencies louder than others. This shows us the response of a room. Our first assignment requires us to record an impulse response of two rooms using the Fuzz Measure Pro software. So we're going to have a look at that next week. You might decide to do, for example, the Audient room and the O2R room, or the Neve room and the C24 room, or you might want to do your home control room and the O2R room. From this software, we are able to analyze the impulse response, or IR, the frequency response, which is this diagram we show here, and the waterfall plot. This diagram, the frequency response analysis diagram, shows us the frequencies that are occurring inside the room. We have a blue and a red line. The blue line is for the left speaker, the red line is for the right speaker. So it shows us how the sound reacts between the different speakers as well. For example, looking at this diagram, I can see that the left speaker has a little bit more of 120, 130 hertz than the right speaker. Again, it's not going to affect our actual mix, but it does affect what we're listening to when we're mixing in that room. We should try and balance this out and even this out, but even being aware of this, we should be aware that we have a little bit more low end in our left speaker than our right speaker, so when we're listening to stuff that's panned in that mix, we should be a little bit more careful with our EQ. The ridges that we see there could be caused by the materials in the room, but they're more likely standing waves in the room. So that blue peak that's occurring around 120, 130 hertz is most likely a standing wave in that room. We could work that out with a the theory, we can also see it on this frequency response analysis. The analysis doesn't show us which surface though is causing that standing wave, and that's why we need the maths and the theory, as well as just the test microphone. A physical analysis, which is what this first assignment is, is looking at a room with a test microphone, doing a physical analysis of the existing room. It can help show problems in the room, but it's not going to show us what's actually causing those problems. That's where the theory comes in. This next diagram shows us our impulse response, or our IR, so this is showing us the actual peak of that waveform in a room. We get an impulse response by simply walking into a room, clapping your hands, or we might also fire off a cannon or a gun. And this is actually going to create a big spike in the room, and it's going to reflect off all the different surfaces in the room. So this is going to show us those first initial reflections. You can see the big spike on the far left. That's the initial hit, the clap or the gunshot. You can see there's a couple of other spikes a little bit further along. Those other major spikes are the first, the second, and the third reflection in the room. So going back to our reverb response graph we are having a look at the beginning, we had those big red lines, the first reflection, the second reflection, the third reflection. They're all the early reflections that are happening inside the room. So again, with this impulse response measured with a microphone, we can actually measure where those reflections are. Getting a measuring tape, we should then be able to actually work out what surfaces are causing these reflections. And that's what we're going to be doing next week for our first assignment. 
So we're going to go through that in class next week. We're going to cover how we do that first assignment, how we use the Fuzz Measure Pro software, which is what's generated these graphs that we're looking at. It's going to let us analyze a room, hopefully our home control rooms, and understand a little bit more about what's going on with the sound inside that room. If you've ever mixed something in your room and then taken it somewhere else and it's got a lot more bass than you heard in your room, it could be your speakers, but it could also be the room that's causing the problems, not actually your speakers. So we're going to start analyzing the room itself, and it's control rooms that we're looking at more than anything else, that mixing room. I actually don't mind standing waves sometimes in a live room, the room that we're recording a band in. Those responses can help create a little bit more energy or a little bit life in the room. Some parts of your live room or recording room might be bassy than others. That's okay. It's our mix room or our control room that's really much more concerning. If you've got a big standing wave at 70 hertz and I can't hear that in my control room, I'm probably going to add a lot of that frequency into my mix. I'll take that somewhere else and my mix will be overly bassy. There'll be a lot of 70 hertz in the actual file. So this is why we need to make sure our control room is even more than anything else. This last diagram that we get from Fuzz Measure Pro is called a waterfall plot or a cumulative spectral display. So this graph shows us the frequency response like the first one we were looking at, but it shows us it over time. From left to right, you can see we've got our very low frequencies from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So that's running left to right across the graph. Volume is represented by the height of this graph. And as the red turns into the blue, that's time. So red is the initial response of the room. That's at the zero, zero point when we first take the recording. As time goes on, we get more towards the green and then towards the blue. So this is also showing us the reverb for the room. So this diagram here is showing us a couple of things. It's showing us that this room is quite bassy. The time is over about 300 milliseconds, or about a third of a second, so it's just a very short amount of period of time. But it's showing us that the blue area, where our low frequencies are occurring, is traveling on a lot longer than our high frequencies up to the right of the graph. So you can see there's a lot of bass in this room that's traveling on for a very long time. This room would sound dark, it would sound bassy, it's not a very bright sounding room. The initial response is fairly even. You can also see three big ridges on the left. And then those ridges that are traveling down around 60 hertz. There's another one about 110 hertz. And another one about 170 hertz. These big ridges that are running from the red down to the blue are our standing waves. So there's a standing wave there at 60 hertz, another one 110, and another 180. Again, the diagram's good because it shows us physically the room's actual response. It's showing us the standing waves in the room. But the diagram doesn't tell us which surfaces in the room are actually causing those standing waves. It lets us know that we have a problem with the room and that the room is not very even, but it doesn't tell us what is causing those problems. So we use the physical and then we use the math, the theory, to actually fully analyze a room. This first assignment is really just going to be based on the physical analysis. So we're going to get a test measurement mic, the Fuzz Measure Pro software. We're going to go measure two different control rooms and we're going to have a look at some of these graphs. We're going to go through this in next week's class and explain it a little bit more in detail. So this lesson today has helped introduce a few new terms to us. We've had a little bit of a look at standing waves. You may have not fully understood exactly what a standing wave is, but we're starting to have a look at these different terms. Modes, again, are standing waves. So an axial mode is an axial standing wave. A tangential mode is a tangential standing wave. An oblique mode is an oblique standing wave. Modes and standing waves are the same thing. Those three types of modes, axial, tangential, and oblique, describe the standing waves that occur between different surfaces in the room. They're the really important parts of acoustics. We've also had a bit of talk about reverb and reflections today. Introduced a few terms like early reflections, which are our first initial reflections off the close surfaces, and then our later reflections, which eventually turn into reverb. After a certain period of time, there are so many reflections in a room, usually after a few seconds, that it just comes across as reverb, and we hear that nice echo that's in a room. So reverb and reflections are the same thing. Modes and standing waves are the same thing. We're going to be using these terms and using this information to really analyze a room to make sure it's nice and even. It's going to give us a better understanding of acoustics. Again, there's a lot of information that we went through today and a lot of information from the first lecture as well. But each class gets easier and easier. Today we've covered most of the terms that we're going to be studying all trimester. So we're going to keep going over this information each week and it's going to become a lot more clear. Don't panic if you didn't quite understand what we were talking about today. We we're trying to introduce some of these terms. We're going to explain these terms a lot more in the weeks to come. We're going to be using them each week in different exercises. If you get a chance today, measure the room you're in, just one of the dimensions, the length or the width with a measuring tape. Take that number, 
get the speed of sound, which is about 344 meters per second, divide it by that length of the width of the room, and that's going to be your first fundamental standing wave for that particular room that you're in. Try and get that frequency, put it into the signal generator in Pro Tools, and pump that frequency into the room. It might be 42.3 hertz. It might be 16.8 hertz. Walk around the room, and you should be able to hear parts of the room that are very loud and parts of the room that are very quiet. If the frequency is too low for you to hear, let's say if it's 16 hertz, you can also double it. So move that up to 32 hertz, pump 32 hertz through the room and move around and have a listen. It's also going to be there at 64 hertz, so you can pump 64 hertz into the room, walk around the room, you should be able to hear parts of the room where it's really loud and parts where it's very quiet. We're also going to do this in the lecture in room 1.1 next week. We're going to find the fundamental frequency or the first axial standing wave of that room. We're going to pump that frequency into the room and you'll be able to hear it being very loud and very quiet in other parts of the room. Again, standing waves aren't necessarily a bad thing. We use standing waves to create resonance, to create musical notes. Standing waves is how pipe organs work and how drums work. We can use standing waves to our advantage. It's partly just understanding the acoustics of the room, understanding the concepts that are going to help us figure out what's going on with the sound in our own control rooms. I'll catch you all next week in our class at the normal time. So we're on Mondays from 5 to 8 p.m. in room 1.1. Next week's class, we're going to be talking about this first assignment, and I'm going to do the first assignment for you in class in front of you. So please make sure you come along so we can figure out how to get this first assignment done. The study of acoustics can be very complex and can be very confusing the first time you hear this information, but the more we go through it each week, it's going to get easier and easier, and you're going to understand all these terms that we were talking about today. It's just going to take a little bit of time for it to sink in. I hope you all have a nice week. If you get a chance, please jump online and try and do the readings from that textbook, and I'll see you all in class next week. Thank you.